Man, I'm glad that we started earlier today. It is roasting up here. I don't know how it is out there, but uh, my bald head is feeling it for sure. Put some sunscreen on, so I think I'll, I won't get too roasted. But it's good to see everybody here today on um, this beautiful July uh, Sunday in the middle of this summer that has been an odd season, has it not? I want to start today, um, and by the way, there is a little outline in your bulletin. You can follow along today. All the scriptures are there, and you can fill in some blanks as we go. Uh, but let me just start today by listing some, some feelings. And let me see if you have felt any of these feelings lately. I've got quite a few. So here they are. See if you can relate to any of these. Frustrated, angry, restless, depressed, empty, confused, misled, lost, disappointed, afraid, annoyed, lonely, struggling, in despair, uncertain, unaware, helpless, hopeless, and weary. Have you felt any of those things in the last few months during this pandemic and with all of the layers that it has brought along with it? We're talking medically and politically and socially and eco economically. It's been a heavy season. It's not been an easy time and it looks like it may not be ending um, in the immediate future. And I've seen it, I've felt it, I've seen it on people's faces that there's a heaviness or there's a despair, there's a sadness, there's an emptiness. So what are we supposed to do? Have you been asking that question the past few months? I know I have. What am I supposed to do? How can we keep moving forward during this time? Is it even realistic in a time like this to have hope for a better tomorrow? That tomorrow will be better than what has been. Is that even realistic? Can a person really experience true joy in a time like this? Things I want to wrestle with today a little bit. And let me ask you this. Has anybody ever had a bad day at work? Raise your hand if you've had a bad day at work. <laughs> Some of you have two hands, okay. Yeah, I've had a bad day at work. You, you've had it. Have you, have you ever had a bad day at work, but, but that night you have some big plans? Like maybe you've got to, you're going to go out with your wife or your husband or your boyfriend or girlfriend, or you've got a big family thing, and so you have something to look forward to, and, and so the, the day isn't going so great, and it's stressful, and it's frustrating, and it's just maybe your boss is getting to you, or things fell apart, didn't work out the way you thought at work, but you remind yourself of what's happening after work. Right? That, man, later on, I can't wait to get out of here because later on it's going to be so great. We're going to celebrate. We're going to have a good time. And so you have this sense of excitement and this sense of hope that this work day is going to end and then good times await. And so you don't let anything ruin it. You ever had those moments where you're getting stressed out and you go, just hold on. I'm not going to let this ruin my day. I have big things happening later. I don't, this is, this is, you, you try to get perspective, right? You don't let things ruin it. Now, if you're, if you're an outsider here today, you're in person or you're watching online, this sort of scenario that, that I'm talking about, this work scenario, it sort of describes what it's supposed to be like to have the true joy of the Lord. This is sort of a, a weird snapshot of, of what it's like to have the joy of the Lord as a, as a believer. And this is a pretty different idea than the idea of happiness. Did you know that those are two different things? Joy and happiness are not the same. Happiness exists when things go your way. But joy exists even when they don't. Let me say that again. Happiness exists when things go your way. We're happy. It worked out. We got the raise. We got the bonus. We got the girl. We got the car. You know, things worked out. Happiness exists when things go your way, but joy exists even when things don't go your way. Because joy isn't based on current circumstances. It's something that you have all the time. Because it's not based on a what. It's based on a who. 
It's not based on what in the circumstances. It's based on who. Joy isn't based on what happens, but on who is with me when it happens. It's based on who's with me when things happen. That's why this, the Old Testament hero, a man by the name of Nehemiah, he tells us in Nehemiah 8.10 that the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength because our strength doesn't rise and fall based on how our week is going or how well our bodies feel or how much money we have in the bank account. And, and I'd argue that it's really only people who know Christ that have the truest form of joy. Because no matter how bad things get, no matter how uncertain or turned upside down things get, Scripture tells us that one day we get to be with God. That's the end game. All roads for a believer lead to eternity with God. And that's reason to have joy. No matter what is going on. And besides, God's the one that's sovereign. He's the one that's in charge of my circumstances anyway. So if he allows things to happen in my life, even if it seems like it's a bad thing, I know that he will always miraculously produce good fruit from it. Have you ever seen that in your life where something bad and you think, oh, this is not good. God, how could you let this happen? And he somehow miraculously turns it around and takes broken pieces and makes a, a beautiful mosaic out of it and, and just extracts good from things that we could never extract good from. But joy remains a mystery for some people. For those that only pursue happiness, which is this momentary feeling or this momentary emotion of excitement and, and fulfillment, I just want to be happy. That's the cry of our culture, is whatever makes you happy. And don't get me wrong, I'm, I mean, I'm all for happiness, definitely, two thumbs up. I, I, I'm not against it, I wanna be happy myself. But not, not that, that it needs to be the ultimate goal and the ultimate purpose of life. For example, we all want to have a happy marriage, right? Whether you're married or not yet, or we wanna have a happy marriage. Of course, that's not a, that's not a bad thing. Happiness is good in a marriage, but what if there's something deeper? What if marriage is meant to more to make us holy than it is to make us happy? What if, we've talked about this in our, in our Bible study group, that what if marriage is meant to be used as a tool to shape us into the image of Christ, to, to make us better and more fully devoted followers of Jesus, rather than to just give us the emotion of happiness? And so this word joy that's used in, in the New Testament is defined as an, an inner gladness that's based on spiritual realities. It's independent of one's circumstances. It's based on things that we cannot see, spiritual realities, not the physical realities. It's, it's a depth of assurance and confidence that ignites a cheerful heart. God says to, to have joy, to, to be cheerful. We talk about giving, we, giving. We talk about being a cheerful giver. Well, joy is what ignites that cheerful heart. So let me ask you a question. Who are some of the most joyful people that you know? Just think about it for a second. There's probably people in your life that you just go, man, they, they, no matter what they go through, they're, they're always just resilient. They just have this this inner joy, this, this cheerful heart that's not based on things that they're going through. You know people like that? Why are they so full of joy? I think of people, even here at the church, I was thinking about, man, who are some of the people? And there's a lot that we could name. Two that came to mind. One is Angela Bonnell, right over there. I think of her, when I think of somebody that's full of joy, just that no matter what's going on, she always, always has that positive encouraging way about her. I think of somebody like Jason Sproul. Where's Jason? Wherever you are. There he is. Look at him. He's jumping up and down. See? That guy is full of joy, and he's an inspiration to our church, to our community. Always ready to sing and be passionate and worship the Lord. 
no matter what's going on. Some joyful people. Well, for followers of Christ, the, the depth of the joy that we experience depends on the depth of our relationship with the Lord. And when we drift from the Lord and when we start to lose our joy and sink down, the tendency is to blame our circumstances. Well, I'm going through this. Or to blame people. Well, they did this to me. Or to, to get really spiritual, to blame the devil. That the devil's attacking me and, he's, and my joy is gone and I, I'm just far from the Lord and it's the devil, it's the devil. Well, the truth is, that no one can take your joy from you without your permission. Do you know that? No one can take your joy from you without your permission. It's totally in your, in your hands. We choose whether we turn over and give up our joy or whether we cultivate it in our hearts. It's up to us. And let's remember that we have an enemy of our soul. His name is Satan and he is real. He's not some Halloween costume. He's not a fairy tale. He is real, and he would love to rob us of our joy if we'd let him. Jesus warns us in John 10.10 10, that the thief's purpose, speaking of Satan being the thief, is to steal and kill and destroy. And I wish it wasn't that way. I wish I could stand here and tell you that that didn't exist but the, the reality, the spiritual reality is that we have an enemy that just wants to steal from you, ultimately destroy you and kill you. That's a, that's a harsh reality. Jesus continued in John 10, 10, my purpose, my purpose is to give them, speaking of those who follow him, a rich and satisfying life. So I'd like to just take the rest of our, our time together here during this message to Simply talk about three common ways that we lose our joy. And then to flip the coin over and follow up with three ways that we keep our joy or that we take it back if we've lost it. So first, the question is, how do I know if I've lost my joy? How do I know? Three things. Number one, you've lost your joy when your circumstances begin to define you. You've lost your joy when your circumstances begin to define you. It's when you're, you're just so used to being discouraged that you don't even realize that you're discouraged anymore. It's just your new normal. It's just normal life. One way that we can assess this, if you're wondering, man, is that me? Is just to ask others, ask your friends, say, is that me? Do, do I just live in discouragement all the time and don't realize it? And that's not always an easy conversation. So there's another way. Simply just take note of your conversations and take note of the content of your conversations. Do you, do you talk about negative things a lot? Or let me ask it this way. What percentage of your conversations are about the struggles that you're facing? What percentage of your conversations are about your struggles that you're facing? That might be a sign that your circumstances are beginning to define you. Your struggles are defining you. I remember going through this a few years back. I found out that, that I was very sick, that I, I was diabetic, and, and then I, a series of events unfolded that weren't even related to diabetes. It was just, I had a, two, three surgeries in, in, in the course of just a couple years, and it was a total mess for a couple years, three years about, from like uh, 2014 to 2017. And the temptation was to let those struggles, all the doctor visits, all of the pain and all of the medication and all that stuff, to just consume my world and to let it bring me down and pull me under to where I wasn't even surviving spiritually, where it wasn't even about God anymore. It was just about everything that I was going through. And so the conversation, you know, the how are you question became different during that time. How are you? Well, let me tell you my struggle. Let me tell you why I'm in pain. And then go through all the nine yards of it. And I found myself doing that some. And then I just, the Lord just kind of nudged my heart and said, is this, is this how you're going to be now? And I just said, you know what? I'm not going to let this stuff define me. I'm not going to let this stuff rob me of my life. So yeah, I'm in pain. I'm still in pain. I'm in pain 24-7. Those of you that are in chronic pain, I feel, I feel your pain, like literally, I feel your pain. 
I get it. But I wasn't going to let the enemy use that as a tool to bring me down, to bring not just my attitude in my own personal life, but to bring my family, to bring the church. And there had to be a shift in my heart. There had to be something that changed. Because you remember what Paul told us, the Apostle Paul, about our identity in Christ? My identity is not in my circumstances, it's in Christ. He told us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. So if we're saved, if we're transformed, if we're made new, if we have the joy of the Lord that is based on spiritual realities, not on what I'm going through, then we should act like it, right? We should act that way. We should act like we're we're made new, that we're transformed, that I don't, I'm not the same as somebody who doesn't know Jesus. I have a different way of being. My attitude, my speech, my lifestyle, everything is, is different. It's not defined by my work or by my health or by my money. If you're a Christ follower, your identity should be found in Jesus and, and in the hope and the promise of a future with him. So you've lost your joy when your circumstances begin to define you. The second thing is you've lost your joy when your faith gets infected by worry. You got any worriers among us? Some of us just naturally, personality-wise, kind of are bent that way. Your faith gets infected by worry. That's one way, one major way that the enemy robs us of our joy. It's because worry diverts our attention away from the Lord and causes us to doubt His goodness and His faithfulness. But Jesus told us not to worry in Matthew 6. Maybe you're familiar with this passage. Jesus said, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to Him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? So how do you know if your faith has been infected by worry? Well, one way is to ask yourself, when was the last time that I took a risk on God? That I, 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 I put my money on God? Or, or maybe the question should be, when, when was the last time that I really believed God for something that was out of my hands? A lot of times we want to control it, right? We, we want to get our hands and everything, but something's out of my hands. And instead of striving to control it and work it all out and stay up late at night just thinking about it and what am I going to do, what am I going to do, I let it go to the Lord. When was the last time that happened? See, joy allows us to walk by faith and not by sight, not by what we see around us in our world or in our own lives. Some, some Christians are so consumed with worry that fear even decides how they make their decisions. Their decisions, their lives are entirely driven by fear, but there is no joy living in fear. There's only bondage. Even with this virus and this pandemic, we act in wisdom, of course, but we don't live in fear because we know the one who is in control, who is more powerful, who was powerful enough to rise from the dead. So we don't have to be afraid of anything that this world has or that the enemy throws at us. The last thing is that your joy, you, you've lost your joy when you lose your hope. Which hope is the belief that in the end things will work out for the good. You've lost joy when you've lost hope. The Apostle Paul, he, he, know what it, he knew what it was like to suffer. If anyone would have had the right to lose their joy, and their hope, it would have been the Apostle Paul. If you know his story, multiple times he was cursed at, he was rejected, he was beaten up and left for dead, he was imprisoned, ultimately he was murdered and for his faith. They chopped his head off for his faith. He had reason to despair. He was in prison on house arrest. But he's still able to, to pour out life and encouragement in his letters. Like what he said to the church in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9, and then skipping to 16 and 18. And I think this, this really, if we grab hold of this passage, 
during this time. Look at it through the lens of what we're facing right now. Paul said, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. And then verse 16, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. And then I love verse 18. I think that this verse applies to where we are right now. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Paul's giving us that eternal perspective, that big picture of, hey, remember where this is going. Remember the final act. It's eternity with God. See, Paul never lost hope. And so we know that the, the battle over your joy, the, the, the last battle that we fight for our joy is on the shores of of hope, because when you lose hope, you don't have much left. But the good news is that if you have lost your hope, if you've lost your joy during this difficult time, you can get it back. So now the question is, how can I take back my joy? How can I do this? If you're, if you're in this place and it's a difficult, dark place, how, how can you get out of the pit? Well, there's a number of ways, but I, I want to focus on three today about how to take back my joy. First one is that joy is found in the presence of God. Joy is found in the presence of God. Get back your joy by worshiping God, like we did today when we sang out to the Lord. That opens our hearts to be, to be open for His filling and His joy to come in. Songs of praise actually shake things in the spiritual realm. They they shake things loose, the, the oppression and the bondage that we go through. Reading Psalms, we see David, who is a musician, who sang songs to the Lord in Psalms. Uh, reading the Psalms can be so encouraging, can restore some of that joy, like Psalms 511 that says, But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing joyful praises forever. Spread your protection over them, that all who love your name may be filled with joy. Read scriptures like Psalm 1611 that says, You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. It's David's heart's cry. Don't take the presence of God for granted. No matter where you are in your journey of faith, you can practice dwelling in the revealed presence of God, the manifested presence of God. We're not just talking about the idea that God is everywhere at all times, that he's omnipresent. Yes, that's true. But there, there is another way that you can press into a deeper level with him where we see the, the presence of God revealed that comes forth, that, that breaks through some of our physical barriers and we can feel him and encounter him. And so joy is found in the presence of God. It may not be the most glamorous or the most novel idea, but it's so effective. Secondly, joy is found in simple obedience. Joy is found in simple obedience. Jesus tells us again in John 15 that I've loved you even as the Father has loved me. And then he says it, remain in my love. Such a weighty statement. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments... You remain in my love. It's almost like you hear a question in there. He says, remain in my love. And you say, well, how do we remain in your love? Jesus already knows the question. And he says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I've told you these things so that, so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Do you see the connection? Sometimes we don't connect the dots there. That joy is found in obedience. He says, remain in my love. How do you do that? You obey my commandments. And when you do that, you are filled with joy. Filled with joy. It's favor. So when, when we obey God, we do that through his word, through the Bible. 
That's what we call the logos, the, the, the general word of God that applies to everybody everywhere. And we also have his voice, his Holy Spirit that we can interact with, that we can hear from. And we obey his voice specifically to who we are. Both of these are important. It's when we get in alignment with God's will. I've heard it said that obedience is like standing under a waterfall of God's favor and blessing. It's just about standing in the right place. It's not that you have to do all these things. You just have to stand there. But, but you know how it is. I know how I am. I want to stand over about 50 feet from the waterfall and wait for it to come down. And say, I want to do it over here. And God's pouring out blessing. And he's saying, you got to come under here. you got to walk in obedience to me. And that's when the blessing falls. Because I'm not in charge. I don't get to decide what truth is and what righteousness is and what, what the way is. Jesus does. Our Father in heaven has set this in motion. And so doing it his way is the way that we can have joy. The third thing is that joy is not found in changing your circumstances. It's found in changing your perspective on your circumstances. Joy isn't found in making everything go your way, making, changing and just praying a thousand times till something changes, till you, you get what you want. Joy is found in shifting how you see things, changing your perspective on your circumstances. David said in Psalm 30, verse 5, Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. Now, you know, sometimes I think something like that can be interpreted as just the power of positive thinking. Like these self-help things. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like you just, you listen to it and they tell you how special you are and that, you know, all these encouraging, just self-help, motivational speaker type stuff. That's not what David's talking about. He's, he's not just trying to give a pep talk like, I know you're suffering, but things will get better. He's saying that, the way God has designed this world is that we will go through hard times. That weeping may be for the night. If you're a believer, don't expect, especially if you're a new believer, don't expect that you will be, that all pain and all suffering and all difficulties will, will be removed from your life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. How? Because the presence of God is there. Not because you just willed it, or because... You, you meditated or you said a, a certain phrase 50 times, it's because the presence of God is alive and he is active and he's available. Joy comes in the morning. The prophet Habakkuk laid this out as well in Habakkuk 3. He said, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, that's a bad day. No crops. And then he adds to it, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, this is not a good situation so far. Are you getting this? There's nothing. There's nothing to eat. There's no life. There's no animals. From a farming perspective, this is, this is terrible. And then he just says in verse 18, he has the audacity to say, yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation, the God who saves me. Verse 19, the sovereign Lord is my strength, not even the food or the cattle or the security that I had. God, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as the deer, able to tread upon the heights. My confidence and my strength isn't found in my circumstances. It's found in the Lord. Even Jesus' little brother, James, he tells us, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face, what's the word? It's a terrible word. Trials. Wait a minute, James. Consider it joy when you face trials of many kinds, he says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You know, I'm seeing a theme here throughout Scripture. There's a, there's a thread that's woven. 
But I think if we were to boil it down, it would say that God is more concerned about your character than he is your comfort. God cares more about your character than your comfort. He cares more about who you are and who you're becoming than if you're comfortable. In fact, comfort can often be the enemy of spiritual growth. We typically grow closer to the Lord in difficult times. And yet, what do we do when we face a difficult time? I know what I do. Oh, God, please take this from me. Get it out of here. Make it all better. Sometimes God just doesn't. He just says no because he's shaping who we are. He knows that this difficulty is what's going to produce the man or the woman that we need to be. And we get frustrated because he doesn't change it, take it away. Maybe that's because we're more concerned with comfort and God's more concerned with character. And so, the story kind of climaxes here with Hebrews. Hebrews 12. We see this the idea of joy being played out in the life of Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, talking about those that have gone before, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Well, how do we do that? He says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. In other words, the, the one who started it all and the one who keeps it going. And then, and then look at what, what the writer of Hebrews says. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. The writer is asking us to change our perspective, to look through an eternal lens. Jesus knew what his death would produce. If he looked at his circumstances when he was facing the cross, he surely would not have made it. But he looked beyond them. His, his faith rose up, and, and that faith gave him cause for joy, even in the worst of circumstances. He knew that salvation for the people that he loved would come from his suffering. See, Jesus' joy wasn't about what he had to endure, but about who he was enduring it for. He endured for us. He endured the cross. He took our sin, our shame, and our guilt. We were destined to be condemned, but God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes, whoever trusts, whoever relies on him will not perish but have eternal life. That is our hope. That is our joy. So even in times like these, where it seems like every week is something's changing, right? Something's different. Some new guideline or church is changing. The government's changing. Our jobs, everything is just up in the air. But our hope rests on a God who loves us and who sacrificed for us. So as we prepare for communion to close our service today, I wanted to just do a little something different at the end here than we normally do. I know it's harder because we're outside. I know there's more distractions, and I know we have our families and kids and all that stuff. But a lot of times when we're inside, we do something called an altar call where we, we ask people if you want to pray or you want prayer to come to the front and to, to encounter the Lord. And so today, we're not going to do it that way. We want to try to keep some social distancing and things. But I wonder if you would be willing to make your chair, your spot, an altar to the Lord. I wonder if you could connect with God in such a personal way that the lid of your heart would just open up. And that whatever you need, God knows what you need that you would open up the lid wide open and receive the joy of the Lord. Maybe you've been running on empty. Maybe you've been frustrated or stressed out or some of those emotions I read in the beginning. But there's a God who loves you, who's totally in control, who wants to pour into you today. As we prepare for communion, you can get your 
juice and your your little cup out. If you didn't get one, we have some over here. Uh, maybe we can get JJ to just help us out. If anybody didn't get one, if you'll stand up or just kind of head towards that way, JJ will get you one over there. Because we want you to be able to participate today. I was reminded of the verse that Jesus got up and read from, from Isaiah 61. And he started by saying, the Lord has anointed me too. And then he says what the Lord anointed him to do. And in verse 3, he says, it's to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. You know, ashes were something they would put on their bodies for mourning, for grief. To, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. The oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise, a covering of praise instead of a spirit of despair. I don't know where you are today, but I was impressed this week that there are some that are feeling despair. And you need to be lifted up by the presence of the Holy Spirit. So as we receive communion, I'm going to pray over you to receive the life-giving water of the Holy Spirit. So let's get our elements ready. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 11. I'll read a verse and then pause and we'll take the bread and then we'll take the juice. The Apostle Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Can we hold up our bread to the Lord and thank him? Most precious Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice for your death on the cross, that you gave up yourself, facing tremendous darkness and just the loneliness that you had to feel and the pain, the physical pain of having your body being torn apart. We realize, Lord, that we did not deserve that, but we can find salvation and healing. We can find joy because you opened that door for us. So we thank you for your body broken for us. Let's partake. Continuing on, verse 25, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's lift up our juice and thank him for his blood. Lord, we thank you for the blood that was shed for us, that in your kingdom and in your economy, the bloodshed is a payment for sin. It, it makes us justified to be in right standing with you. And so spiritually, your blood washes us and makes us clean and makes us white as snow. That nothing that we've done or said or any shame that we carry, nothing will be held against us if we will turn to you and trust in you and be covered in your righteousness and be cleansed by your sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, that you gave your life, your blood, so that we could have life. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. Let's partake. Now, I want to pause here for a minute. 
before we go, but let's not let's not rush for a minute. Just we haven't had a lot of these kind of moments to just sit and rest in the Lord. Just rest in Him. Whatever you have need of, now's the time to pause in, in the busyness of the day. Maybe you need to put out your hands in front of you. Just put them up to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm, I'm hungry for you. I'm desperate for your Holy Spirit. Fill me up. Maybe fear has gripped you or some kind of bitterness. Or you've been distracted by all the government stuff and politics and social media is eating you alive. Take a rest and receive from the Holy Spirit. I pray right now, Lord, over my friends that are here and those that are watching, that the rest and the joy of the Holy Spirit would fall upon us. I pray for peace in their homes and in their hearts. I pray that those that have turned away, that those that have been like the prodigal son that turned away, that they would come back and find their loving father. I pray for those that are dry and empty, that you would be that living water that you talked about at the well with the woman who was in need. That when we taste of you, that our soul is quenched. That we can enjoy you in spite of what we might be facing. So before I pray the benediction over you, I'd just like to have it quiet for just a, a few moments and this is your chance to engage the Lord or if you're an outsider today just to take a moment and rest let's see what the Lord would say Bless your name, Jesus. We honor you. We lift up your banner. May everywhere we go, may we just have the fragrance of the Lord on us. May we trust in you more. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for doing this together today and for being a part of this special moment to just enjoy the Lord. Thanks for coming out early today. I know it's not always easy when we change times and all that. We'll meet again next week right here at 930. And we're going to keep going, keep moving forward in the joy and in the strength of the Lord. So may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you and be gracious to you and give you peace. And may you be a light in the darkness. Amen. And amen. I love you. Have a great week. We'll see you. Uh, Wednesday, hopefully on Zoom for Bible study or next Sunday. Take care.